is the Obedient Church of God, broadcasting worldwide on the internet. I can tell by your eyes that you've probably been crying for you. Yes, Father's been crying for 6,000 years because we're so disobedient. All the Christians, all the five foolish virgins. The stars, Genesis 1, 14, mean nothing. Can't even get the first book of the Bible right. Lights will mark days. Reach about it. Church of God is standing alone against all of the denominations, every Christian denomination we're against. All of the five foolish virgins, the five foolish virgins of the offshoots of all the worldwide churches of God, we are against them because they do not follow God's Bible. about it how you broke God's heart if I stay here just a little bit longer if I stay here won't you listen to God's heart of the Bible. You cannot move God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world with a phony international dateline. You're all going to hell if you don't repent. All you ministers of the worldwide churches of God moving the Sabbath day to Friday in half the world, you're going to go to hell for deliberately, knowingly breaking God's Sabbath. Well, welcome to the obedient church of God. We are the Nazarenes. We are of the same doctrine of Paul. And we're telling you how you broke God's heart. So bonjour, Paris, France. C'est le 16 août, le 13 midi, le Dudinier en France, 6 p.m. supper time in Paris, 9 a.m. on the West Coast, 12 noon in New York City, breakfast time, supper time, lunch time, the perfect time for your spiritual feeding today. Yes, you're breaking God's heart by your willful disobedience of moving God's Sabbath to Friday in half of the world. And by your willful disobedience of having the Passover elements on the 15th, taking the bread and wine on the 15th, when the Bible clearly states the 14th is the day of the Passover. And indeed, the second Passover we just had this last week, and in Numbers 9-11 it says, On the fourteenth day, dot, 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 eat it! When do you eat it? 
on the fourteenth day, dot, 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 eat it. Eat. Not the fifteenth day, the fourteenth day. Read it in the New International Version. On the fourteenth day of the second month at twilight, they are to eat it with unleavened bread and herbs. Now, if it's after twilight, then it's the fifteenth day, and you're disobeying God's Bible. So get it straight. It is the fourteenth day for the first Passover. It's the fourteenth day for the second Passover. God says so, and it's not for you to change or to worm your way around it and try to wiggle around it. And slither past the fourteenth day and onto the fifteenth day. God says the fourteenth day. And look, no animal becomes an offering until it's consumed. Until it's consumed by the fire on the altar, then it becomes an offering. The same way as the animal did not become an offering until the animal was consumed, the Passover elements do not become an offering until they are consumed by you on the 14th. On the 14th. Not a day later. Because then you've missed the Passover. You're too late. You're too late. The animal was consumed on the altar on the 14th. The elements symbolizing the blood and the body of Christ are to be consumed on the 14th, just like the animal was consumed on the altar, like the lamb was consumed on the altar. You are to consume the elements on the 14th, not consume the elements on the 15th. The 15th is a totally, totally, totally different period of time. Just like Shemini Atzeret is a totally, totally, totally different piece of time from the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, today we're going to try to pull more of you sheep out of the mud. And to try to, we're going to be telling you about the Sifro. You know, one minister just can't get it. He's reading directly out of the Kabbalah. Directly out of the Kabbalah, which is based on the Zohar, which was written by demons automatically. We're going to give you the key today. Do you know how you examine yourself? You examine yourself with the Ten Commandments, not with the Ten Sifirot, which have <laughs> diabolical, satanic influence on you. And this minister doesn't even know that what he's practicing is known as the meditative Kabbalah, which uh, focuses on adopting physical techniques to achieve a higher spirituality. He is actually practicing the meditative Kabbalah because the Kabbalah has been divided into three major disciplines. The first discipline is called the theoretical Kabbalah, which consists of study and in-depth analysis of the Torah and study of the scholars' writings who are familiar with the Torah's implications on what kind of a level? A metaphysical level. <laughs> a metaphysical level in the spirit world. Theoretical Kabbalah, that's the first division. The second division, which you are practicing and you don't know it, is called the meditative Kabbalah, which focuses on adapting physical techniques to achieve higher spiritual states. And the last is the practical Kabbalah, which takes the form of extracting aspects of the Kabbalah to affect the physical and spiritual world in a completely autonomous way in black magic. This form of Kabbalah is blatant occultism, and it's condemned by the Bible in Leviticus 19.31, verse 31, verse 20, verse Leviticus 20, and verse 27. 
and practical Kabbalah is overlapped with the same principles of the meditative path of the Kabbalah that you are practicing and that is the most popular among mainstream. You don't know what you're doing. I've got to say it stronger than that. You don't know what the hell you're doing! You're practicing meditative Kabbalah! Give your head a shake! Well, we'll be telling you more about that today. And on the positive side, we are the work of God that we are the Nitzarim. We are not Christians. Paul wasn't a Christian. Paul was the leader of the Nitzarim. Acts 24, 5, whether you like it or not, Paul was not a Christian. He was the leader of the Nitzarim. And you've got all these offshoot churches of God claiming that they're a Christian church. Well, and following the footsteps of Jesus. Well, Jesus wasn't a Christian either. He was a Nazarene. We'll tell you all about that. He was called a Nazarene, Matthew 2, 23. And he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth that he might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Jesus was not called a Christian. Jesus was called a Nazarene. And Nazareth literally means town of the watchmen. And you know, Paul was accused of being the ringleader of the Nazarenes in Acts 24, 5. Paul was accused, brought up on charges of being the ringleader of the Nazarene sect in Acts 24, 5. And it states, for we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. And now we, the obedient church of God, are Nazarenes. We are not Christians. Christians delve into satanic practices, such as the Kabbalah. Christians move God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world, like Triumph Prophetic Ministries does. Paul was not a Christian. Paul was a Nazarene. Well, we're going to be telling you more about that today. And there's two ways of pronouncing it, if you wish to note it. It's Netzarim. N-E-T-S-A-R-I-M but for the purposes of understanding we'll just say that we're Nazarenes. We follow Yeshua. Yeshua was a Nazarene. And yes it means town of the watchmen. And Paul was the leader of the Nazarene. I do like that. Paul wasn't a Christian. Well, we're going to try to pull you out of the mud and have you stop practicing the Satanic Kabbalah. And you're reading right out of the meditative Kabbalah. This meditative Kabbalah's words, which you adopt physical techniques to achieve higher spirituality. It's totally satanic. That's what the witches do. That's what the warlocks do. They use the, in fact, they do use the Kabbalah. They use the Kabbalah to elevate themselves to higher spirituality instead of using the Ten Commandments. So you want to start examining yourself, you know, check out the commandments. Check them out. See how many times you've lied this year or last year. Start using the Ten Commandments. See if you've ever lusted after anyone, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. You know, you commit adultery, you think about it, you're committing adultery. You've got the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Sephiroth. You've got to get yourself straight, people. 
He's trying to do a fancy dance with Sifirot on kindness and forgiveness and balanced anger, and you haven't even got the Ten Commandments right. Unbelievable. And you're practicing Kabbalism, mysticism. You're a Kabbalist. You're a Kabbalist. Look, people that call themselves Christians practice Christianity. So, therefore, you're a Christian. People that practice Kabbalah are called Kabbalists. So, you're practicing meditative Kabbalah. It's exact same words that are in the Kabbalah that you're using. It's the exact same Sifiro. Can it be any clearer? You're practicing Satanism. Whether you say so with your big yapping mouth or not. And by the way, you're a liar also. Because you say it's done by the rabbis. Written by the rabbis. Yeah, written by the rabbis, all right. By automatic writing from the Zohar, where the demons wrote it. And then you cover it up. You cover it up by saying the rabbis wrote it. The rabbis wrote it. No, they didn't. The demons wrote it. It was automatic writing. And you're lying to your members saying, trying to dress it up by saying, oh, the rabbis wrote it. What a pile of dung when you try to cover up the origin of the ten Sifero that are taken directly from the meditative Kabbalah. You're lying saying that Jew Jewish rabbis wrote it up. Demons wrote it up. Look, you've got the Ten Commandments to worry about and focus on the Ten Commandments. That's, that's what you focus on. And I can guarantee you this one minister isn't obeying all of the Ten Commandments. And I know that for a fact. That's all I'll say. Well, welcome to the Nazarene Church of God. And for those of you who repented and practiced the Passover on the 14th, second Passover on the 14th of this month, and that was on Thursday before the sun went down, in the USA, and it was on Friday before the sun went down in the Philippines. So now you're right with God. Now you have redemption for your sins. And all of those of you who practiced it on the 15th of the first month, you missed it. You missed it. You were a day late. You missed the train. Train already left the station. You missed the Passover. And you missed the second Passover, too. The Passover is on the 14th, whether you say so or not. The sacrifice is to be consumed on the altar, burned up on the altar on the 14th, and the sacrifice is to be eaten on the 14th, not the 15th. Ah, we'll tell you more later. First, let's enter the throne room. So please rise. Face the north heavens, where Father and Yeshua are. Arms raised, eyes closed, head bowed. Almighty and most merciful, loving Father, thank you for leading the obedient Church of God into all truth. Thank you for raising up a Romans 9, 28 work and leading us week by week into more of your truth so that we can repent and that we can be polished by your word, your word, not the satanic Kabbalah's words, but by your Ten Commandments, and get our lives right and in harmony with you so that we can fit into the God family perfectly as your shining jewels. Thank you for all the blessings and protection you've given us this last week, and indeed over the years to keep us alive so we could come to this point of praise for you. 
Please be with the brethren in Pakistan. It's so dangerous there. They're murdering others, other people in other cities that are practicing on the Sabbath day. So please protect our 200 plus brethren in Islamabad who are doing their best and who celebrated the Passover one day later than we did because they waited for the sun to go down. Oh, Father, we count on you to inspire all things and lead us further into the truth as Nazarenes, just as your, father, your son was a Nazarene, Father. So now we commend the service into your hands and ask for your inspiration, both on the speaking and the hearing, and especially on the videotapes when the people listen so that if you're calling them, that they can understand. So now we turn the service over to your hands and ask it all in our King's name, Yeshua HaMashiach, our mighty powerful warrior king who's coming to destroy 200 million men on this earth. Power and glory be to Yeshua and you forever for it. Amen. Ah, yes. Welcome to the Church of the Nazarene. They're not Christians. It's going to take a while for some people to get used to that. Paul wasn't a Christian. Yeah, Constant, Constantine was a Christian. Yeah. Constantine and all the other sects were Christians. Yeah, yeah. But not the Nazarenes. Not the Netzerene. We are the Netzerene. Maybe I should give you some information about that right off the beginning. You know that Yeshua was foretold, foretold he shall be called a Nazarene. Matthew 20, verse 23 of Matthew 2. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, Netzarim, that's another way of phrasing it. Well, they followed the Torah as it was taught, and they believed that Yeshua was obviously the Son of God. And in the book of Acts, Thousands, thousands of Jews and Gentiles were being added to the called out ones, the Ecclesia, to these Nazarenes, not to the Christians, to the Nazarenes. You got Acts 2, 41 to 47, Acts 4, 4, Acts 6, 8, Acts 9, 31. Let's turn to one of those. Thousands of Gentiles were being called. Just a sidebar, yeah, thousands were being called in, but how many ended up at the end were only 120? Out of all the thousands that had been called in, only 120 stayed faithful. So let's turn to the first reference, Acts 2.41. So we can see that there were there was a work going on that was calling large numbers of people. And verse 41, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, with one accord, they all agreed, they all agreed on the doctrines in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness, gladness and simplicity of heart. Not with convoluted sifferot. Let's find the other reference. In Acts 4, 4. Find out get a bit of an inkling of the character of these people. However, 
Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. 5,000. So you can see that this was a magnificent work of Yeshua. Because the priests were disturbed. Yeah. The priests were upset. So in verse 1 of Acts 4, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, hassled them, hassled them. Being greatly disturbed at them, they, that they taught the people and preached Jesus in the resurrection from the dead. Well, these are the Sadducees. They don't even believe in a resurrection. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail, in custody, until the next day, for it was already evening. But, 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 verse 4. However, many of those who heard before they were thrown in jail, were, they believed. And the number was 5,000. 5,000. So now we get an idea of what's going on here. We've got 5,000 that had heard. That's a lot of people, 5,000, especially for those days when the populations were smaller. Well, let's go to Acts 6, verse 7. Get a bearing on the Nazarenes. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So now we've got the priests also following the word of Paul. And remember, Paul was accused of being the ringleader of the Nazarenes, not of any Christian. Group. So in Acts 24, let's pull it up and read it. So some of the priests were actually following Paul. Acts 24, verse 5. Dot, dot, dot. Go to the last few words. A ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now let's read the whole thing in verse 5. For we have found this man, they're referring to Paul, because you go to verse 1 in chapter 24 of Acts, and it says, they gave dot, 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 they gave evidence to the governor against Paul. Against Paul. Against who? Against Paul. And then in verse 5, we have found this man, Paul, dot, 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 a leader of the Nazarenes. There you go, folks. You don't want to be a Christian. It's pretty bad to be a Christian. Christians don't observe the Sabbath day. Christians move the Sabbath day to Friday in half the world. Christians don't live in Sukkot for seven days. No, they might dally in the sukkah for an hour a day, but they're not going to stay in a sukkah and sleep in it, put a heater in it, snuggle into a sleeping bag, and sleep in the sukkah. Well, that's because they're not Nazarenes. They're Christians. Hmm. And they're going to celebrate Turkey God Day. That's because they're not Nazarenes. They're going to have Mother Goddess Day. They're going to have Sky Father's Day. Hmm. Starting to get the picture? We, the obedient church of God, don't have any days or ways that were not constituted by Yeshua. And we certainly do not have the meditative Kabbalah doctrine, which is totally satanic, because the witches try to build themselves up to higher spirit levels by studying the Kabbalah and the warlocks, all of the occult, that's one of their best books is the Kabbalah, so that they could heighten their 
position in spirituality, and especially with the Tensifero in meditative spirituality. And you're reading their devil's words. What do you think you are doing reading the words and descriptions of the Tensifero of the Kabbalah? from the Zohar, what do you think you're doing? Are you insane? The Bible says, do not add, do not preach a different gospel. You've got the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Sifero. Unbelievable how deceived people can get. Get rebaptized if you can't understand that. So that you can have the Spirit of God working with you. Well, the Netzarim adhered to the observance of the Torah, so the Netzarim adhered to Deuteronomy 12.32. Don't add any days, don't add any ways. And the same thing with Galatians 1.6. Don't preach any different gospel, don't preach any different doctrines. Just stay with what you've got in the first century truth of the written Bible, New Testament. So we see here that even the priests, even the priests, here's the point I'm trying to bring out, the priests were joining the Nazarenes. That's what your Bible says. The priests were joining the Nazarenes. Could that be any clearer? Maybe we should read it again. Let's turn back there. Let's check out if it was in Acts 4.4. 4, where you can see that the priests were joining the Nazarenes. Let's see. Well, that's talking about the 5,000 men. Okay, so that's one reference. And in 6 verse 7... There we go. This says that the priests, the priests from the Sanhedrin, were joining the Nazarenes. Verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and a number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Okay, that's fine. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. What faith? The word of the Nazarenes. Because Paul is a Nazarene. He's not a Christian. He's a Nazarene. Well, they allowed the non Nazarene Jews coexisted. The Jews coexisted with the Nazarene. But they tried to persecute him and prosecute him. And the book of Acts is showing it that the priests were obedient to the Nazarene faith. So you want to know what faith you should be? You should be a Nazarene. Pretty clear if you follow your Bible. Well, first of all, the Nazarenes, they weren't Jews necessarily. They followed the Messiah, Yeshua, of the New Testament. But they weren't Christians. And they came from many different nationalities and from many different cultures. And they no longer considered themselves Gentiles either, but Israelites. More specifically, in particular, Nazarene Israelites. And they see themselves as grafted in members of the Commonwealth of Israel. Now, Nazarenes, or how they were known in, in the Hebrew, was Netzarim, N-E-T-S-A-R-I-M, were thought of as a unique group of Jews who they believed in John the Baptist, John the Immerser, and he, they believed that John 
the Baptist was the messenger sent to prepare the way for Messiah, according to Malachi 3.1. We're all familiar with that, which says that God Father would send someone to his temple. I'll send you my messenger who will prepare the way for me. That's John. Then suddenly the Lord you're seeking will come to his temple. So the name Nazarene or Netzarim or even Netzari in singular is Netzari. It means offshoot branch watchman. Offshoot branch watchman. Now specifically the name refers to those who follow Yeshua, follow the one who sprang forth from the root of Jesse. Indeed, Isaiah 11.1, 1, a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. Isaiah 11.1, 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now guess what the Netzarim means? means offshoot branch watchman. Well, let's go to Isaiah 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of, in Hebrew, will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel. See, the Nazarenes believed that Yeshua was Moshiach, the Messiah, foretold of by the prophets. But they didn't ascribe to Christianity. And Yeshua, he was called a Nazarene, according to Matthew 2, verse 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene, because he went to the town of Nazareth, and he lived there. He dwelt in a city called Nazareth. He was called a Nazarene, because he lived there. You know, if you live in California, you're called a Californian. Okay. Now, the name Nazarene Israelite carries the declaration of a believer's membership within the Commonwealth of Israel. And this gives a frame of reference by identifying, instantly identifying, this type of believer in accordance with scriptural terminology. Now, there's further proof from Gamaliel. You remember you found Gamaliel in the Bible that the Netzarim had arisen in the time of Gamaliel, the elder. Now, Gamaliel was a leading authority in the Sanhedrin. And he, Gamaliel, Gamaliel publicly spoke about this sect. In my notes here, it says the group gained notoriety through a devoted group of Talmudim disciples who followed Yahshua ben Yosef, Y-O-S-E-P-H, who, so many notes here, was viewed as a controversial rabbi performing many miraculous healings. Surprisingly, this activity was not something exclusive to Yeshua's ministry, notwithstanding the extent and volume of healings. Okay, let's skip some of this. And it goes on to say, Yeshua had taught at a Galilean yeshiva, that's a school, and synagogue that was chiefly financed by Kephas, K-E-P-H-A apostrophe S, that's Peter's family, 
Oh, this is, and it's interesting here. His Peter's family owned a fishing and a pickle, pickle business, which was located nearby. And the notes say here, a visit to the actual site in Galilee to view the ruins of these buildings supports that the initial conception of Yeshua's ministry was no haphazardly or minor formed affair. They weren't just walking around the street as itinerant preachers. Yeshua had taught in the Galilean yeshiva and synagogue that was fi financed by Peter, who owned a fishing and pickle business. Chiefly financed. So, so the, the, the church, the yeshiva, was financed by Peter. You know, we got this concept that the disciples and uh, Yeshua are just wandering around from place to place. Well, there says here that Yeshua taught at a school, a Galilean yeshiva and synagogue. It also says here, it was certain that he didn't pick up just a handful, handful of fishermen he'd never met before. Okay? He, Yeshua, was teaching at the yeshiva where Peter's family all basically owned the yeshiva and financed the yeshiva. So it wasn't a casual stroll down the shore of Galilee uh, picking up fishermen he'd never met before. It's an actual Galilean school where Yeshua had taught at, and synagogue that Yeshua had talked, taught at, that was financed by Peter. Now I pulled up some early church views of the Netzarim, what the early church writings uh, show about their objection to the Netzarim. And in the writings of Ephanius, E P I P H A N I U S of Salamis, S A L A M I S, a prominent early church father, is perhaps the most accurate account of the general Christian perception of the movement of the Nazarene, of the Nazarenes. Through this account, there's a negative tone towards the faith. But it captures their identity. So we're going to read it to you here, which, what they actually wrote about Yeshua's group called the Netzarim, where you saw that it is an ah, which means offshoot branch watchman. And it's Netzari or Nazarene. Here's what they said about them. They called them sectarians. And Yeshua's group didn't call themselves Christians, but Nazarenes. All right, let's read exactly what the uh, writers say here. And we'll, we'll stop where it might be vague. Here's the, way, the exact quote. But these sectarians, dot, 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 they're referring to the Nazarenes, did not call themselves Christians, but Nazarenes. However, they are simply complete Jews. Okay, so they're knocking them already. They're saying, ah, oh, they're only complete Jews. Then they say they use not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well, as the Jews do. Dot, dot, dot. They have no different ideas. Wrong. Yes, they do. But confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it and in the Jewish fashion. Remember, the Jews didn't even believe Yeshua was the Son of God. Except for their belief in Messiah. For they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things and declare that God is one and that his Son, Yeshua, is the Messiah. 
They are trained to a nicety in Hebrew. For among them, the entire law, the prophets, and dot, 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 the writings, dot, 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 are read in Hebrew as they surely are by the Jews. They are different from the Jews and different from the Christians only in the following. Here we go. They disagree with Jews because they have come to faith in Messiah. But since they are still fettered by the law, dot, 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 they are not in accord with Christians. They are nothing but Jews. So here's where they've got it wrong, you see, because the Jews don't believe in, you, in Yeshua as God's son, and they're calling them, they're nothing but Jews. But the, the point is, they're also stating that the Nazarenes are not in accord with the Christians. They are not in accord with, with the Christians. This is the actual account. And this is from Epiphanius, E-P-I-P-H-A-N-I-U-S, Panarion, P-A-N-A-R-I-O-N 29. Okay. In conclusion here, they say they have the good news according to Matthew in its entirety in Hebrew. For it is clear that they still preserve this in the Hebrew alphabet as it was originally written. So, let's underline this. Here's what you need to underline. The actual account of the Nazarenes states, and I'm quoting here, and I'm underlining it in the notes, they are not in accord with the Christians. That's the point we wanted to bring out. The Nazarenes, the Netzarim, Paul, he's the ringleader, he's the leader, Bible says so, is not in accord with the Christians. There you have it. And they're, they're coexisting with the Jews, but they're not part of the Jews. So, the notes say here, the Netzarim adhered to the observance of Torah as it was taught by the scribes and the Pharisees, but they held a belief that Yeshua ben Yosef har Nazareth. That's Jesus. <sighs> I wish they'd write it more clearly. They held to the belief that Yeshua, the son of Joseph of Nazareth, was the Moshiach, the Messiah, spoken about by the prophets of the Tanakh. Oh, okay. So, let's simplify this. The Netzarim believed that Yeshua was, was the chosen one by God, spoken of by the prophets, was the Messiah. The Netzarim believed that Yeshua was the Messiah. I'm glad I know how to make notes. Let's just write that in here, because instead, the Netzarim believed Yeshua was the Messiah. Just about have to translate the whole thing the way they've got it written. Here's what they had written again. Now we know that they're trying to say that they believe, the Netzarim believed Yeshua was the Messiah. So what they're saying is Netzarim adhered to the observance of Torah as, as it was taught by the scribes and the Pharisees, but they held to the belief that Yeshua ben Yosef Harnazet, brackets, Joshua, brackets, Jesus, the son of Joseph of Nazareth, Close, Nazareth, close brackets, was the Moshiach spoken about by the prophets of the Tanakh? Why can't they just say, Nazarene believed Yeshua was the Messiah? All right. Later, Rabbi Shaul Hashilayak, S H A apostrophe U L, A capital H A capital S H L I A C H, was accused of being a ringleader. That's Paul. Oh. 
was accused of being a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Why can't they say it properly? So, translation here. Paul was accused of being the leader of the Nazarenes. And they are quoting here Acts 24, verse 5, for that we have found this man of plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. By the book of Acts, thousands of Jews and Gentiles were being added to the Ecclesia. They called out once, daily. I remember we read, just read, some of those scriptures. Which scriptures didn't we read? We didn't read chapter 9 of Acts and verse 31. So let's go there and see what it says. Acts 9, 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So they're including the Church of the Nazarenes here. And don't get that confused with any worldly Church of the Nazarenes, because maybe we're going to be calling ourselves Netzerai, so that no one can get us all mixed up with other false, phony groups in the world today. So there's 931 saying that they were all walking and they were multiplied. They were all walking in the fear of the Lord and were they were multiplied. All right, let's check out the last one, back 6, verse 7. It's definitely saying there's a group of them. Verse 7 of Acts 6, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests, priests, priests from the Sanhedrin were obedient to the faith, to the Nazarenes. So let's everybody write in their Bible to what faith? Yeah, the Bible is hidden in here. The faith of the Nazarenes. Yes. So I'm putting in where it says we're obedient to the faith. Faith. That's Sarai. That's what they were obedient to. Not just in a colloquial term, faith. They were obedient to the priests were obedient to the Netzarai, to Paul's faith. And Paul was not a Christian. He was a Netzarim. And we're Netzarim. We're not Christians. We'd actually told you that last week. Well, let's see what else they say here. It says, Such was the impact of Yeshua's teachings and actions that non not long after his death and ascension, his own brother, here we go again, Rav Yaakov Ha Tzadik, R A V space, capital Y A K O V space, capital H A, capital T Z A D D I K, the just. Okay, we figured this one out. That must be James the just. James the Just, because there wasn't any other just around except James the Just, was appointed as head over the Sanhedrin, and a significant portion of the priests who served in the temple also became associated with the sect. Well, hallelujah, things are going pretty good for the Nazarenes. So we got James, let's start underlining it, and translating it. James... The just, okay. Let's try this. The Nazarene, James. Hmm, maybe the Netzarai. The Netzarai, James, was appointed as head of the Sanhedrin. Wow! So the Netzarai, James, was appointed as head over the Sanhedrin. And then it says, and a significant portion of priests who served the temple also became associated with the sect. So that substantiates that it was the Netzarai that was appointed head 
of the Sanhedrin as Rav Yaakov Had Tzaddik the Just James. So, James was head of the Sanhedrin. How do you like that? Okay, and a number of the priests who served in the temple also became associated with I'm not going to put sect, oh, sec, well, let them put sect, but I, with as Netzarai. As Netzarai. This is wonderful. It substantiates everything the obedient Church of God has discovered. And the number of Talmudim, well, followers, Talmudim they're calling, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of Kohaman, those are the priests, were obedient to the faith. What faith? Not the Christian faith, the Nazarene faith. Not Sarai faith of Acts 6 7. So let's reinforce it by turning back to Acts 6 7 and see what faith it was. Well, that's one we read before. The word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And we had read where, where Paul was being dished, D-I-S-S-E-D, -S -S -E for being a leader, the ringleader, the ringleader of the Netzarim. Keep putting this all together here. Make it all coalesce here. That was in Acts 24 5. We have found this man of plague, a creator of dissension among all Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of Nazarene. So they finally got on Paul's case when they, you get all the way to Acts 24. And they didn't like the idea of him rocking the boat by following the Bible. And we've also got James, James the Just, as the head of the Sanhedrin earlier. And a great many uh, Kohavim, priests, were obedient to the that's a ream. Okay, let's read what else they say. This passage exhibits very solid evidence in the Brit Kadashan, that must mean the New Testament, that the faith of Moshiach, Jesus, and Shilishim, S, capital S H L I C H I M, now that's Jesus, and not Jesus, Yeshua, and it must mean the apostles was, uh oh, they're saying not that far removed from Pharisaical Judaism. Well, scratch that one. They got that one wrong. Anyways, they say, if it were, no priest would have in any way been involved with the movement. Well, from that context, it makes sense. So they're saying that the movement followed the Bible, the strict interpretation of the law, which the Pharisees do, it do did, and it says, this passage exhibits the very solid evidence that the British, Brit Kadasha New Testament, that the faith of Moshiach and the Shil Lichim apostles was not that far removed from Pharisaic Judaism. If it were, no priest would have been involved with the movement. Now, oh, here comes the trouble. Not for us, but for them. Unfortunately, a fraudulent addition of the word church, K, capital K-I-R-K-E, forward slash, capital C-I-R-C-C, which denotes a particular Greco-Roman version of the faith, included in many Bible translations, has robbed many readers of seeing a clear picture of what was really going on at the time. Oh, there you go. So all they're saying is that the way it's worded, that, that by just calling things church, 
instead of correctly calling them the Netzarim, is robbing readers of the Bible of what was really going on. This, this article, here we go. The Book of Acts, if you read the Book of Acts with Christian eyes, you'll usually fail to see the Netzarim coexisting alongside mainline Judaism of the day. And it says, even if it was only for a comparatively short time. When the Christian reads the fraudulently added word church in his Bible, this shifts him from seeing the emergences of a sect, and instead he sees the formation of a new religion. Well, you see, that gets it all mixed up, because people think that it's a Christian church. Well, the Netzarim were not Christians. A Nazarene Israelite is not a Christian. And the reason is, this is because Christianity denotes a Greco-Roman-centered version of the faith that still retains its full Gentile identity. To say, to stay a Gentile puts one in a state of having no hope, according to Ephesians 2, 11 to 12. Well, of course, because we're grafted in. We're grafted into Yeshua's tribe. All right, so Ephesians 2, 11 to 12. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcised made in the flesh by the hands that at that time you were without Moshiach, without Yeshua, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. Okay, so when you're a Gentile, you've got no hope. So of course you've got to be grafted in as part of Yeshua's family. So to embrace the Greco-Roman Greco -Roman version of the faith is to directly renounce the three core pillars of the faith outlined in Isaiah 56.6. Isaiah 56.6. And... Say if we should go there. Isaiah 56. We don't want to get this complicated, but we do want to reinforce the truth that we are not Christians and we are not Jews. We are Netzarim. So the reference here is Isaiah 56 and verse 6. It's really going to shake up your relatives to know that you're not a Christian. Hmm. Here we go. Isaiah 56, 6. And also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Oh, wow, that really applies in today's world where half... All the churches are moving the Sabbath and not holding fast or defiling the Sabbath in half the world. So this is who they, we are, the Netzarim are. They're foreigners. That's us. Who join themselves to the Lord, who is Jewish, to serve Him. Okay, so let's everybody put it in their Bibles. And the sons of the foreigner, put your name, who joins themselves, put your name again, to Yeshua, to serve him. Okay. So that's you. You're the foreigner who joined yourself to Yeshua, to serve him. Another translation. Let's see if we can find it here. And foreigners who bind themselves to serve. Well, all right. Let me do the translation here. They've got it in Hebrew writing. Ah. All right. And foreigners who bind themselves to father, serve him, to love the name of father, 
and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and hold fast to my covenant. Okay. They've got some notes on Christian theology replacing the names of Yeshua with a Hebrew set of lettering. Uh, let's bypass that. All right. New paragraph. A Nazarene Israelite is someone who observes Torah with the knowledge of its realized identity in Yeshua HaMashiach. He does this with the understanding that no piece of the Torah has been abolished, marginalized, or altered. Matthew 5, classic scripture, 17. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law. Remember I keep saying there's even more law now. You can't even think of murdering your neighbor or being angry at your neighbor. You can't even think of murdering your enemy. You're supposed to love your enemy. as more law. It's harder. So anyone who steals from you, you can't even think of getting even at him, getting back with him. That doesn't mean you let him steal again, but that means you don't get even, you don't get back, you love your enemy. There's more law. More law. Okay, so here we go. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest jot or tittle, pen stroke. Well, let's look around. Is the earth still here? Yeah, the earth is still here. Not until the earth disappears shall I abolish one jot. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the Torah, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So unless your righteousness surpasses all these ministers that are moving the Sabbath day to Friday in half of the world, including all the Jews who are moving Fri the Sabbath day to Friday in half the world in Australia and the Philippines and China and in India you know and India's got 3.1 billion and China's got 3.2 billion that's nearly when you start adding that up wait a minute that's more than half of the world we've got 7.3 billion oh. well there you go let's start saying two-thirds of the world moving the Sabbath to Friday in two-thirds of the world Okay. Well, regarding the Netzarim, it talks about the devotion to Torah in accordance with its observance in spirit. Well, that's important. And preceded by the fear of Elohim is confirmed in Isaiah 11, verses 2 to 5. All right. The spirit of Father will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and of power. It doesn't say Father, by the way. I'm saying Father because that's what these Hebrew letters mean to me. So the spirit of Father will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and that of understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Father. And he will delight in the fear of Father. Now oh, there's a new one for you. So, you're going to delight in the fear of Father. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt of faithfulness to sash around his waist. Well, there we go. We've got the spirit of the Father and the fear, the fear of the Father. So that tells you something. And that's confirmation of Moshiach's devotion to the Torah. Let's put this all together. 
So Isaiah 11, 2 to 5, says that Yeshua feared the Father. That's what it says. And he delighted in the fear of Father. So there's a bear note. Yeshua feared the Father. It says so in Isaiah 11, 2 to 5. But Yeshua didn't have anything to worry about because Yeshua always was obedient. So Yeshua delighted, delighted in the fear of the Father because he didn't have, as we say, no sweat, man, because he obeyed. He obeyed the Father. So he delighted in the fear. Well, we're, we're investigating the credentials of our movement, our movement, the Netzarim. That's who we are because we do exactly what Yeshua did. We do exactly what Paul does, did. And we don't add anything. We don't add one jot or tittle. That makes us the Netzarim. Watch out, the other people are, are in deep trouble. They are in deep, people that aren't Netzarim are in deep trouble. You know, remember in Ephesians 2, verse 11 to 12? Remember, formerly, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, let's read it, Ephesians 2, 11 to 12, Therefore remember that formerly, 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 you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Messiah, excluded from citizenship in Israel. So now we, Netzarim, are ex-Gentiles and are now citizens of Israel. And it said here, before when you were a Gentile, you were without hope. Read for yourself, Ephesians 2.11. If you still want to be a Gentile and call yourself a Christian, you're without hope. And without Elohim in the world. So that's how in the notes here, that Ruth, Ruth uh, ceased from being a Moabite. So at the time when Ruth, Moabite Ruth, told Naomi that your Elohim shall be my Elohim, so she ceased from being a Moabite and became an Israelite. So she's a different ite, not a Moabite, but an Israelite. Therefore, that's what happened to us. We also are Israelites now. Now it says the Nazarene Israelite movement has often been accused of being a sect. Those who have rejected such, such accusation prepare for a shock. This faith is indeed a sect, in a good sense. So goes on to say, I guess they're heading towards the difference of saying that calling something a sect isn't a bad thing. Let's see what they say. A person's ignorance of the word's true definition gives this argument life. Okay. A, the ignorance of the word sect, its true definition gives this argument life. So the true definition is a good thing, that a sect is a good thing goes on to say, on the contrary, no one should make any apology for use of the appropriate terminology. If one is weathering this accusation, take comfort in the knowledge that Rabbi Shaul, here we go again, Paul, S-H-A apostrophe U-L, was also accused of being a ringleader of this same Nazarene sect, Acts 24, verse 5. Consider the choice of language used in the following two verses as they appear in most Bible translations. Acts 24, 14. Now let's go to Acts 24, 14. And 
Let's see how they're dishing us again. D I S S I N G. Acts 24, verse 14. And they're bashing us again. Let's see what it says. Acts 24, 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the Law and the Prophets. Therefore, we, the obedient Church of God, are proud to be called a sect, because in the Bible, in the first century, the, the people following the way, in verse 14, in verse 14, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect. So, the way was the Nazari, which Paul was the leader of. They called it a sect. So this works in concurrence with not considering yourself as a sect to be something bad. All right. It says also, hmm, let's see what it says in further on in Acts 28, 22. And they're bashing us again. Acts 28, 22. They're dissing us, dishing us again. Acts 28, verse 22. And it says, But we desire to hear from you what you think for concerning this sect. We know that it is spoken against everywhere. Uh -oh. So when we get to the end of the book of Acts, everybody is against the Naz Sarai, the Nazarenes. The beginning of the book of Acts, we had even the Sanhedrin being led by James the Just. Now we get to the end of the book of Acts, in chapter 28, and they're dissing us. They're calling us a sect. Verse 22 again, but we desire to hear from you what you think for concerning this sect. We know that it is spoken against everywhere. All right, so we're called a sect, and we're proud of it. Notes here, it says, A sect, by definition, is not sacrilegious unless it's branded as a heretical sect. If this were not true, the term heretical sect would be a grammatical tautology. T-A-U-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Here we go. A useless repetition of words that have the same meaning. Heretical set sect. If this were not true, the term heretical sect would be a grammatical tautology. Okay. So therefore, that all fits together. The definition of sect is a separatist group characterized by loyalty to a certain school of thought and practice. A sect, a party, a school. This is an accurate way of describing those who have followed the way for many generations. The scriptures more affectionately refer them to as remnant. Here we go. All right. So let's use the word remnant. We will scratch the word sect and use the word remnant because the scriptures refer to them affectionately as the remnant. And we'll back that up. So, we've got other issues here where they call it a sect of Acts 5.17. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates 
That is the sect of the Sadducees. And they were filled with jealousy. So the Sadducees were called a sect. That's the point. Acts 5.17, the Sadducees were called a sect. Acts 15.5, the Pharisees were called a sect. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up. Okay, Acts 26, 5. Pharisee, according to the strictest sect of our religion. So, sect isn't a bad word. But, 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 we like the word remnant. So, we're going to underline in our notes here. Scriptures more affectionately refer to them, the Netzarai, the Nazarim, as the remnant. Even though we've just shown that the Pharisees were called a sect, the Sadducees were called a sect. So sect isn't to be interpreted in the colloquialism as something evil. But since people determine it as evil, as dishing us, let's say we're the remnant. And let's see what else in the notes here. Isaiah 43 can also be referred to as a voice according to Isaiah 43. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth the desert a highway for our Elohim. Then the notation here, the tree of Jesse mentioned in the book of Jeremiah, oops, the book of Isaiah, refers to Moshiach, who must have descended from Jesse of Bethlehem, Bethlehem through his son David. B-I-T space capital L-E-C-H-E-M. That's Bethlehem through his son David. Another notation, the correct fully earthly name for Yeshua is Joshua, the son of Joseph the Nazarene. Joshua, the son of Joseph the Nazarene. I think we're getting a good picture here that it's the Nazarene sect that came from Yeshua who lived in Nazareth and was the son of Joseph, who was also a Nazarene. Good. Let's look at some of the archaeological writings of the Sanhedrin, and you can read Gamaliel's findings after an interview with Yeshua's parents, Joseph, Joseph, and Miriam, Mary, according to this work, his conclusions, okay, his conclusions, Gamaliel's conclusions, corroborate not only his later wait-and-see attitude toward the Netzarim in Acts 5, but his, Gamaliel's feelings toward their sons, Joseph and Mary's son, to be eligible to be Mashiach, to be the Messiah. So it all fits in perfectly as the Nazarene of Joseph, the Nazarene. And Jesus is the son of Joseph, the Nazarene. All fits together perfectly. So we can say with complete accuracy that we are the remnant because we are not Christians. We are Netzerim. We are the Nazarenes. And Paul was not, not, not the leader of the Christians. Paul was the leader of the Netzerim, the Nazarenes. So that should come as a wonderful discovery of our rediscovered truths here. 
Therefore, we're on the positive. We're on the positive. And we humbly are doing God's work as the Romans 9.28 work. And we're tearing down all of the useless altars of the pagan and the heathen and the sheep that have fallen into the mud. And that includes a lot of the offshoot churches of God. And since we were on the topic in the announcements in the beginning of the service, we don't even have time for announcements in this church in these meetings. We've got too much real meat to go on than worry about what's happening in the world. We know what's happening in the world. We know more than anybody else knows what's happening in the world because God's Spirit leads us. And we told you that the Boston bombing was another false flag operation. And we even showed you how it was. The guys in the black jackets and carrying the backpacks and it wasn't the guys who were accused. And we showed you how the other bombings in the theater that the guy who was accused was actually locked in a trunk while a psyops officer in a Batman cost costume and a mask goes in and shoots up the theater. We shown you that 9-11 was a government Reichstag burning to get everybody into the war in Iraq because the building came down and it can't fall, free fall, unless it's blown up and thermites cutting all the beams at a specific microsecond. Oh, that's why they took all the metal away to China so that it couldn't be traced for the thermite residue. And that's why the, the rubbish, the, the pile, the metal pile, burned for three weeks. It was still burning after three weeks. And no jet fuel, kerosene cannot melt steel, cannot cause rivets to fail. Even if the building sagged, it would not break because it's not hot enough to cut. It's only hot enough to cause a sag, but then the beams are insulated anyways. And they're not supposed to sag. And never has there been a case ever in the world of a plane knocking down a building. Never has happened. And other fires have burned 12 hours, and this fire didn't burn 12 hours. And the building still stood with the fire. Look, we know what's going on in this world. We, we've shown you that all of your leaders are Masons. And they're all giving the goat devil sign. All of them. Devil sign. They're giving it all of them. Go to our internet site. You'll see what you're dealing with. We told you that Netanyahu is a 32nd degree, 33rd degree Mason. Obama is a 32nd degree Mason. Even Arafat was a Mason, you know. And here's, here's a sidebar, so you know how this world works. These guys who are in control of all the world, it's like a big card game going on at a big table. And they're all around the card table. And they're all fishing out, shuffling away, and making their plays. It's like a, let's, let's say, a, it's, it's a heavy duty card game. You could call it like a monopoly game too, to see who can get the most of everything. Occasionally, there's a fight at the card table. And one of them shoots the other one. But that doesn't stop the game. The card game still goes on and on and on and on. So you got players that didn't want to go along with the US dollar, such as Saddam Hussein, who went on his own standard for the oil and was undercutting the oil prices. Saddam Hussein was a CIA plant from way back in the 1980s. He got off his leash on the card game table and he was killed. There was an argument on the card game table, so he had to go. That is the truth of how this operation runs. It's a big card game. And occasionally, someone gets shot. A country gets shot. Blown up. But the game goes on. The game goes on. 
and they'll always have the game going on. They won't let anything interfere with their game. No matter how many of them get shot, the game has to go on so that they can grab the remnant chips of whatever is left that the last guy that they shot, they just take all his chips. Then they might fight over his chips and they might shoot somebody else again. But the game goes on. So we, the obedient church of God, know what's going on. Remember, I told you the Nazis just moved over to America. <laughs> it's the same thing going on. And it, we're not going to get into that. We don't have time for that. We, we should take a little time here to go over to try to pull some sheep out of the mud who are into the Kabbalah. Into the meditative Kabbalah. The sheep that are reciting word for word and studying word for word the meditative Kabbalah. And if you are doing the ten Sifero, you are doing Kabbalah, whether you say so or not, because first of all, the ten Sifero are taken directly from the Kabbalah. Period. End of story. The ten Sifero are taken directly from the Kabbalah. There's three trees in the Kabbalah, in the Sifero of the ten. Let's keep with giving you the exact. Remember I told you that the Kabbalah has three major disciplines. Three major disciplines of being a witch, of being a sorcerer, of being involved in the Kabbalah. The first is a theoretical Kabbalah, which is a study and analysis, the scholarly study of the Torah, and you get familiar with the Torah's implications, but on a metaphysical level, on a metaphysical level, in a spirit realm level, not on a human level, you study the Kabbalah, you study the Torah, contemplatively on a spiritual, physical, occult level to see where the angels are, to see in Genesis 6-4, and study about the Nephilim, study on and on and on that the sons of God sang for joy at the creation of the earth on a metaphysical level. The second level is called the meditative Kabbalah. And it focuses on techniques. Techniques to develop a higher state. A higher state as a witch. To be a better witch. A more balanced witch. To balance out your good and balance out your evil. And that's why you have everything inside of everything in doing the Sifero. Because you're balancing out. You're balancing out your evilness. The last is the practical Kabbalah. And that's actually trying to affect the physical and the spiritual world in autonomous ways. And in order to affect the spiritual and physical world, you have got to be schooled in meditative Kabbalah in the Ten Sifero so that you can affect the spiritual world, so you can work your black magic, you can work your spells against the physical world because you studied it out in the meditative Kabbalah section, which gets you balancing the energies of the good and the evil, of the yin and the yang. And that focuses on your developing physical techniques to achieve a higher spiritual state as a witch. A more balanced witch. You are practicing Kabbalah if you are going anywhere near the Ten Sifero. Just to straighten you out, you've got the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Sifero. The Kabbalah was done by automatic writing. It wasn't done with Jewish priests being godly men. 
It was done by mediums who were Satanists, who were allowing demons to enter them, and they would write the Kabbalah automatically. And the writings of the Sifero are based even worse than the Kabbalah on the Zohar, on the automatic writings of the Zohar. If you're practicing the Sifero, you're practicing mysticism, whether you say so or not. And indeed, they even describe it as mysticism. And then one minister tries to dismiss the word mysticism. Unbelievable. Look, if you practice the techniques of Christianity, well, in this case, Nitsare Nazarenes, you are a Nazarene. If you practice the techniques of the Kabbalah, you are a Kabbalist, whether you say so or not, because you're practicing the techniques for 49 days. And those techniques come out of the Satanic writings of the Zohar and the Satanic writings of the Kabbalah are not by nice little Jewish men. They're by demon-influenced Jews who are writing automatically with a demon writing through their hands. They don't even know what they're writing. And the Sifero, get this straight, the Sifero are from the Zohar. Now you've got to examine yourself with the Bible's Ten Commandments, not with the Zohar. Not with the Kabbalah. And where's the truthfulness of this one minister who's covering up, deliberately covering, lying, lying that the Sifero are not contained, taken, never mind contained, minister lying that the Sifero are not taken directly from the Kabbalah. The Ten Sifero. There's a chart of the Ten Sifero. Go do a search on the internet of a Ten Sifero tree. Tree. You know, there's a positive side to the Sifero, and there's a negative side to the Sifero. There's a yin and the yang, and it's structured in a tree. And there's, you know, Ha, Chesad, Gevira, and then they're all balanced out on the other side of the tree, and then they're all inter interlinked by 22 paths, occultic paths. It's worse than you think. It's worse than you think. And yet, you're going to be willfully ignorant. Willfully ignorant. Second Peter 3, 3 to 5. What does Second Peter have to say? I know it says something. It'll say willfully ignorant. When you're told that the Sifero came directly out of the Kabbalah and you're going to still use it, you are being willfully ignorant. And you're getting yourself in trouble again with God. Second Peter 3, 3 to 5. Not to mention Hebrews 10, 26, if you know that the Sifero are satanic you <laughs> and you still use them. There's no sacrifice for your sin. 2 Peter 3, 3 to 5. Knowing the first, and scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of this coming? For the fathers continue to sleep, and all things continue as they were from the beginning. So they scoff. They scoff. They say they can do what they want. They say they're going to practice the Kabbalah. They're going to lie and say that the Ten Sifero are not taken directly out of the Kabbalah. They're going to lie and they're going to break Deuteronomy 12.32 and add ways to the Bible. They're going to break Galatians 1.6 and add to a different, preach a different gospel of the Kabbalah. And then Hebrews 10.26, when they're told about it, they ignore it and become deliberately, woefully ignorant. Now you want to ascend to the divine, do you? Well, I got news for you. It's Christ's sacrifice that enables you to ascend to the divine, not the Ten Sifero. And it's the Ten Commandments 
that enable you to improve yourself. Not the ten rotten, stinking, self-centered Cifero, the mystical Cifero of the Kabbalah that it claims to enable to ascend towards the divine. Well, God states, don't add to his word. You've got the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Cifero. Now, it goes even worse in the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah has different worlds, worlds to it. And in my notes here, it says each world, my notes says each world can be understood as a descriptive of dimensional levels of intentionality related to man's nat natural desire to receive and a method for the soul's progression towards unity with the return to the Creator. The terminology of this formulation is based upon the ex exposition of the Lurianic Kabbalah of the 20th century Kabbalist Yehuda Ashlag, A-S-H-L-A-G. There are 32 paths of wisdom. Now remember I was of the Kabbalah, in the Kabbalah, 32 paths. Now remember I was telling you the 10 Cifero? How do you get the 32 paths? This is straight Satanism, folks. Because you have the 10 Cifero, and you have the 22 channels, and that adds up to the 32 paths, which connect them. It's Kabbalah you're practicing. You're just omitting the 22 channels. Well, you better get the 22 channels, too. Well, in fact, you are doing the 10, 22 channels, but you don't know it, because you're connecting Had with Gevira, and Gevira with Chassad, and you are. Well, how do you like that? You're doing the 32 paths of wisdom. Because not, are you, not only are you learning the 10 Sifro, you are running the 22 paths and connecting them. Oh, are you in trouble? <laughs> oh, you're, going, you're right in demonology. You're using the 32 paths of wisdom in the Kabbalah and you don't even know it. My notes here says, and this is back on topic regarding the tree. The Kabbalah is set up in a tree. It's got three sections. To envision the tree, consider each of these ten spheres as being concentric circles with Malkuth being the innermost and all others encompassed by the latter. None of these are separate from the other and all simply help to form a more complete view of the perfected whole. To speak simply, Melchuth is the kingdom which is the physical world upon we live and exist, while Kether, K-E-T-H-E-R, also called K-A-E-T-H-E-R and K-A-E-T-H-E-R, Elyon, E-L-Y-O-N, is the crown of this universe, representing the highest attainable understanding of God that the witches use, that men can understand. Not that Nazarenes can understand, not that Christians can understand, for lack of a better word for you guys that don't know that you're supposed to be Nazarenes and not Christians, that men can understand the highest attainable understanding that the witches use. The 32 paths of wisdom. Now there's also the Sifirot representing the four worlds. Let's see if we got time to squeeze this in. The Sifirot and the four worlds. There are ten levels associated with the Kabbalah Zohar. Four different worlds or planes of existence. The main part is the perspective of a chain of progression that links the infinite divine with our finite physical realm in all worlds. The ten Sifero radiate and 
are, here you go, the divine channels through which every level is continuously created from nothing. So here you have it. It's the divine channels. It's not God the Father. It's not Yeshua who are creating everything from nothing. It's the divine channels. Since they are the attributes through which the unknowable infinite divine essence becomes revealed to the creations, all ten emanate in each world. Nonetheless, the structure of the four worlds arises because in each one certain sephiro predominate. Each world is spiritual apart from the lower aspect of the final world, which is our... Here we go. As... Yah Gashim, A S I Y A H, second word, capital G A S H I M. Physical Ashia, or our physical universe. Here's the point. Each world is progressively grosser and further removed from consciousness of the divine until it is our world, it's possible to deny, to deny God in ascending order. So in our world, you have people denying God. But you, as a witch, can climb up the order by using the ten sephiro to a progressive world that isn't as gross as in our world. In the Zohar and elsewhere, there are these four worlds or planes of existence. In the Luriatic system of Kabbalah, five worlds are counted, compromising these at a higher fifth plane. We can go on here, but we're out of time. The four worlds link the infinite within our realm and enable, here's the point, enable the soul to ascend. You don't have a soul, you are a soul. To ascend in scriptural, numerological, and spiritual association of the Sephiroth tree. Of the Sephiroth tree. So you're climbing the Sephiroth tree when you're using all of the ten sephiro. And they're arranged into three columns. In conclusion, because we're totally out of time again. The ten sephiro arranged into the three columns with the 22 paths of three types. So therefore, remember that we said that you're on to the 32nd path. Because you got the 10 Sephiro, you got the 22 channels, I'm putting it all together for you. Bear note, here's the proof that it's satanic. Here's the proof. The 32nd path is that of administrative intelligence. That's the 32nd path. And the 32nd path is achieved by combining the 10 Sephiro plus the 22 channels. And... Hang on to your seat. The 32nd path is named the worshipped intelligence. The worshipped intelligence. And that's straight out of the Yetzirik text, Y-E-T-Z-I-R-I-C text. The 32nd path is named the worshipped intelligence. And remember, it's the 10 Sephiro plus the 22 channels of the egg within the egg within the Ishad and Hod inside of Chez. Anyways, it's worshipped intelligence. And why is it? Because it is so called, because it directs and associates the motion of the seven planets, directing all of them in their own proper courses. This is all part of the Sephirotic tree and the 22 paths of connection. Inclusion, I'll give you, I'll give you the columns so you can figure it out. Well, you don't want to figure it out, but let's say there's, there's three columns to this tree. This Kabbalah tree that you're studying, you don't even know there's three columns to it. Here are the columns. There's a central column. The central column is the pillar of mildness. The pillar of mildness. There's more to it than that. It's, it's again trying to balance the two opposing forces of male and female and the neutral one. Let's just keep it simple. Write this down. Write this down. Central column, the one in the middle, is the pillar of mildness. The right column 
is the pillar of mercy. And the left column is the pillar of severity. And that's where you're supposed to balance it all out so you can climb up the tree and you can be divine. Well, you follow the Ten Commandments if you want to be divine. You don't follow the Satanic Cicero. You're reading Satanism. You're reading, reading Satanism. And by the way, I'm going to do some research on the letters of... How, how do they get the name Kabbalah? That's, that's sort of tweaking me. So I'm going to try to look up the breakdown of the name, where it came from. And it comes from K-A. I know that. And I know it's B.A. And something tells me those are names of Egyptian gods or something, or something has to do with Egypt from my past readings. That's where the name Kabbalah comes from, I believe. We'll do more research on that for you for next week. Okay. In the numeric, numerological sense, the tree of Sifarot also has significance. Between the ten sephirot run twenty-two channels or paths which connect them. The number which can be associated with the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, together the spiritual forces, here we go, spiritual forces of the ten sephirot and the twenty-two connecting channels are called the thirty-two paths of wisdom. You're straight into the occult of the 32 paths of wisdom. Now, from my research, it looks like the Jews tried to pass off the Kabbalah as their own. But when I'm going to go and study the entomology of the word Kabbalah, I believe that they are from Egypt and are high magic high Egyptian magic and very, very satanic. And the, the origin for Satan, or Satan, S-A-H-T-A-H-N in Hebrew. Satan, the origin for Satan. Well, that's the hidden agenda of the Kabbalah. Most people, in conclusion, we're out of time. In conclusion, most people do not knowingly know they're going towards Satan and towards Lucifer. And they end up worshipping Luciferian doctrine. And they're tricked into doing this. And your Kabbalah, the books of the Kabbalah, pretend to be about Jewish history. Here's the premise. And what you're reading is not history. It's actually mysticism. It's not hidden knowledge about the Bible. It's not hidden knowledge about the universe. It's actually what the Kabbalah is actually doing. The system of the Kabbalah, of the 22 channels, if you look at their claim and where it's derived from, it's derived from Satanism, of ascending the tree of 32. You are espoused to be the husband, the bride of Christ. You're espoused to be one true, a pure virgin, a pure virgin with no satanic influence anywhere around you. And the Kabbalah that you're the Cifero in the Kabbalah, you're not a chaste virgin. You're not a chaste virgin. You're now messing with Satanism. You know, and, and you go on and on and on, and I've got more in my, my notes here of how the tarot cards are based on, on, on the Kabbalah. That's all the time we've got. You know, we're out of time. So don't be studying Kabbalah and not knowing it. Not knowing it by saying you're counting the Omer. You want to count the Omer? I want to count the Omer. Today is the 30th day of the Pentecost count. I just counted it. So did you. Mark it on your calendar. Count, count, count. 
So examine yourself with the Ten Commandments. Build yourself up on the Ten Commandments. See if you're a liar. See if, see, see, see if you're abusing your body. See if you're a, a, obese. See if you're destroying your body. Just like you destroy your body with cigarettes, you can destroy your body with food. You know, and end up with diabetes from overstuffing yourself and having to have your legs taken off, having you losing your eyesight. It's like smoking causes cancer, overeating causes diabetes. Examine yourself. You're looking after your temple. We're the most obese people on the planet. The Americans are the most obese people on the planet. So use the Ten Commandments to examine yourself. See if you're in the truth. See if you're in the truth. Use the Ten Commandments. See if you're keeping the Fourth Commandment to have the Sabbath day on seventh day throughout the world. Throw your stupid, ignorant Sifirot away and start obeying the Ten Commandments, especially the Fourth Commandment, which means you have the Sabbath on the seventh day in Australia and stop disfellowshipping people who have the Sabbath on the seventh day. Get the Ten Commandments right. Study the Ten Commandments. And then, maybe, God will forgive you and you can be in His kingdom by following every jot and tittle of his word and not any satanic Kabbalah and you can learn to be a Nazarene to be like Yeshua and stop being a satanic Kabbalist we always go over time but we have to have to want to, it's important to give you as much information that we can. So, now let's conclude with a hymn. And unless the Lord shall build the house, we want to sing that one. The weary builders toil in vain. Use that Cifero, you're toiling in vain. You better get the Ten Commandments first. Stop lying about the obedient Church of God. Stop lying, <laughs> saying the obedient Church of God is disobedient Church. <laughs> oh, that makes you a liar. Not only are you breaking the Sabbath by having it on Friday in half the world, you're also breaking the commandment of not to, thou shalt not lie. Hmm. Okay, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord shall build a house, all please rise and reflect on the words. Unless the Lord shall build the house, unless the Lord shall give you the doctrine, the Ten Commandments out of the Bible and only out of the Bible, or else you're toiling in vain. I'm running it back here to get the right volume setting for you so we can all sing out together follow along with the words if you don't have the hymnal page 96 unless the Lord shall build a house the weary builders toil in vain unless the Lord does say he shields the guards may take Yeah. 
With the closing prayer, I'll stay standing, face the north heavens, arms outstretched, head bowed, eyes closed. Almighty, most merciful Father, with Yeshua at your side, help us to be fruitful vines. Help us to be like olive plants. Help us to be like your Nazarim. Help us to be like Yeshua of Nazareth. Help us to be like Paul, the Nazarim. Help us to be Nazarenes. Indeed, thank you for this knowledge. It's very important. Help the sheep to come out of the mud and filth of the Kabbalah, of the Sifero count that is totally satanic and occult, trying to climb the divine tree of knowledge to make yourself a more powerful spirit. Oh, help the minister, one particular, to obey the Ten Commandments, stop moving the Sabbath day to Friday and half the world, stop lying about the obedient Church of God being disobedient. Oh, Father, call out those who you are calling. Work with those who you are working with. In that regard, thank you for all the help you've given the obedient Church of God. Thank you for our new worker named Christian, of all things. So please protect Christian from being hurt, because if people get hurt around here, and he's, he's a younger guy, and he doesn't know how to look out for himself and even I got hit by a couple of rocks and the machine fell over on the other guy a 31 year old guy it didn't kill him though so protect the new Christian and help him so now father we ask for your protection also from the state police from the county police from the local sheriff from the stormwater department from the building code oh and from any accidents so put your angels around us all and all the members of the obedient church of God and all of those you are calling into the obedient church of God, put your angels around them so we can continue to learn and grow and we can be your teachers as the net serum of Yeshua and Paul. So now, Father, we ask for your dismissal. We ask it all in Yeshua HaMashiach's holy righteous name, our soon arriving warrior king who will slay 200 million. Amen. Yeah, no pussy footing around when Yeshua comes back. No pussy footing around right now. So, I'm going to close off here with trust and obey. So, as you're learning these things, that you are a Netzarim, think on it, meditate it, on it this week, and trust and obey. Obey those Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's the broadcast for today. As you walk in the Lord, there it happens. When we walk with the Lord, in the light of His Word, what a glory He shares on the way.